So I started studying John chapter 12 for our time together in the Word, and this image came to mind as I was studying. How many of you know what this is? This is a ba- blast from the past. Anybody know what this is? It is a scale, absolutely. Do you know what we use? This, this is a legit scale that we had a purpose for a thousand years ago. Maybe not that far, but Bible school, yeah. So you remember this. Some of you were around maybe, and when, when I was a kid, we used this at Vacation Bible School, and this was used for what we called the Penny Parade, the VBS Penny Parade, and here's, here's how it worked. Uh, it was kind of like the offering. We still do offering. We just don't do it quite like this. But we would encourage kids to bring their their change, bring their pennies and their coins, and uh, they would come in and bring them down the aisle, and they would, you know, toss them in the bucket. It'd be a lot of fun, and then we had a competition. And they would usually do, one year it'd be like boys against the girls. That was a lot of fun. One time they did, I think, grasshoppers against the bumblebees, or they did blue against red. They would kind of split up. It was always a competition, and they would bring in, have kids bring in their coins, and they would toss them in their team's bucket, and then, of course, they'd count that up each night. They'd have a winner each night, and then a winner for the week. It was a lot of fun. You weren't allowed to use paper. There were rules to this. Uh, we couldn't use paper money, so we would usually have someone that would stand either outside or just inside the door. They had a little table. I don't know who they were. Maybe they were bankers. I don't know who they were, but they, they had, you give them your dollars, and then they would exchange that. They'd give you, you know, coal, uh, coin rolls, and then you would take those, and you'd throw those in real hard so it would, you know, make a big sound. That was a lot of fun, too. Uh, my, my recollection of that, I look back and I'm trying to remember, like I know what we do with our offering in VBS now. We always have a purpose. We, we tell people what that purpose is for the, the offering. But at the time, as a kid, I honestly didn't care. Maybe they told us. I have no idea. I wasn't listening to that part of the announcements if they did. All I know is I wanted to win. If it was boys against the girls, we had to win. If I was on the grasshoppers, we're going to destroy the bumblebees. That was my whole week. Like they, Maybe they gave the, the pennies to Jesus. Maybe they gave them to missionaries. Maybe they threw them in a fountain somewhere. I don't know, and I didn't care. All I knew is I wanted my side to win. And that made me kind of think about uh, what we're going to read today in, in John chapter 12, this VBS penny parade image. If you look at that with me, John chapter 12 starts off with a parade. As I was studying this, uh, this, this image kind of came to mind. The next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, chapter 12, verse 12, swept through the city and a large crowd of Passover visitors took palm palm branches. They went down to the road to meet him, and they had this impromptu parade. They didn't throw pennies at Jesus. They had palm branches, and uh, they shouted, blessed be the king. It wasn't a penny parade. It was a king parade. It was a here comes the Messiah parade. It was very exciting. It's a very exciting theme, and that's certainly uh, maybe one reason why you think I would think of this scale this penny parade from my childhood, but it's, it's actually not. That's not why I thought of it. When I get into the next section, we already, we already did Palm Sunday back around Easter time, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. If you missed that sermon, you can go back on our website and check that out. I want to go to the next section because in the next section of, of Scripture, Jesus begins to talk about priorities. And when it comes to priorities... Just like when I was in VBS, and we, you know, the goal at VBS was not, let's try to make it balance out perfectly. That wasn't the goal. The goal was we want one side to be heavier than the other because we wanted to win. But when it comes to priorities, that, this is not the goal. Trying to achieve some type of balance when it comes to our priorities is not the goal. Priorities are not about trying to achieve balance. Priorities are not about trying to figure out how do I measure out equal amounts of time and effort and energy into all things in my life in equal amounts. That's not realistic, and it's not even a good idea. Because there are some things in life that are more important. There are some buckets in life that have greater value to them than other buckets. And so when it comes to priorities, it's not about trying to find an equal measure. It's not about trying to find balance. Its uh, Priorities are all about trying to figure out first things first. 
Your job is important. Your job requires, if you work, your job requires a certain amount of effort and time, and certainly you need to be throwing those coins into that, into that bucket. That matters, right? But there are other buckets in your life that matter more. Your marriage matters more. Yes, you have to go to work. You've got to pay your bills. That, that's important. But if you're, not, if you're not throwing coins, if you're not throwing pennies into the bucket that's marked your marriage, and all of your coins, all, all, all the pennies are going into some other buckets, whatever it is, and this one is empty, this one uh, hasn't seen a coin in quite some time, your priorities are off. Because that bucket matters more. Maybe, maybe you like to spend time you know, playing pickleball. Nothing wrong with pickleball. Maybe you like to collect things. Seashells down by the seashore. I worked on that all week. Yeah. I collect seashells down by the seashore. Maybe that's what you like to do with your time. Nothing wrong with that. It's not sinful to collect seashells and have a very nice collection or whatever. You have a hobby, you have an activity, you have these different things that you enjoy doing. They require coins, they require pennies because they require time and effort and sometimes actual physical money. One day you and I are going to stand before God and I just, I, I just don't imagine that the conversation when we stand before God is going to sound something like this. Lord, I'm so excited to be here in heaven. When, when exactly is the pickleball tournament, the big heaven pickleball tournament? I have been spending so much time on my swing for the last 10 years. It is amazing. I'm going to kill at this pickleball tournament. When is it exactly? Where do I sign up? I don't think that's what we're going to talk about. I don't, I don't imagine that when we stand before God and we're having a conversation with him about our life and we look back over our life that the conversation is going to be, Lord, uh, it's a real shame. It's a real shame that I couldn't bring along with me my seashell collection. It is amazing. I really think it would have spruced up this place if I could have just brought my seashell collection along. I just don't think how that, how that conversation is going to go. Why? Because not everything in life is of equal importance. Not everything, not every bucket in, in our lives has equal eternal value. There are some things that are just more important than others. So priorities are not about trying to figure out how do I achieve balance between all the things in my life. Priorities are about learning how to put first things first. These daily choices that we have to make every day. Let's imagine you've got, you got one penny, two buckets. You've got to make a choice. Which bucket are you going to put it in? You can't put it in both. Well, we have to make a decision. And we do this every single day. We make choices. We have certain amounts of coins that we have for the day. And we've got to put them somewhere. How do we make those decisions? What, how, how do we decide what we're going to give greater weight to, greater importance to in our lives? It's not that we don't have, uh, that n- none of us are absent from, from priorities. It's not like there's someone in the room that says, I don't have priorities, I just kind of go with the flow. That's not true. We all have priorities in our lives. We make these daily decisions about what we believe first things should be. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, am I throwing the pennies in the right bucket? Am I giving weight to the right priorities? Priorities are about putting first things first. And this morning, Jesus, in his word, is going to teach us about how to do that. He's going to teach us how, how do we figure out what first things first priorities should be in our lives. I think it's going to be really helpful as we read this next section of Scripture. So if you're not there already, join me in John chapter 12. I'm going to jump into verse 20. Verse 20 says, Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip. Philip's one of the disciples. Tells us here that he was from Bethsaida in Galilee. I think that information is there. 
maybe to let us know, the reader know, this is probably why they sought him out. Maybe he, uh, he had a name that they recognized, or maybe he was from their region. Some reason uh, that they sought out Philip had to do with where he was from. And so they went up to Philip, and, and they said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus. Well, 22 says that Philip wasn't, I guess, sure what to do with that request. So he told Andrew, another one of the disciples, and, and they went together, and they brought this request to Jesus. Now this term, Greeks, that's there, really it just means Gentiles. It's not necessarily someone who uh, was ethnic, ethnically Greek. It just means someone who's not ethnically Jewish. Now these Gentiles, they were there for the Passover, not because they are ethnically Jewish, they are there because they are curious. They are, they are there because they are seeking truth. They're interested in the Jewish religion, they're interested in learning more about this, uh, this one true God, and that's why they're there. They want to learn, they, they want to find truth. And it's likely that these Gentiles, maybe, maybe what created this interest in Jesus, because this was kind of new as far as Jesus and, and their interest in, in him. Maybe what spurred that interest had to do with the parade that happened. They're coming into Jerusalem, there's this big palm parade, everyone seems excited. What's going on? Oh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. They get to hear that story and maybe like, we got to meet Jesus. Or when we read the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find out that the next thing that happened after the Palm Parade, the Messiah is here parade, uh, the next thing that happened, Jesus went to the temple. And at the temple, there are different sections. And there was what's called the Gentile Court. It's huge. It's a huge courtyard. And it is for the Gentiles to gather. And they can gather there and learn. They can gather there and pray. But they were not allowed past this barrier. There was a half wall into the inner part of the temple. They were not allowed past that. And so they had this Gentile court at the temple where they were allowed to gather. And if you remember the, the story, when Jesus went there, he noticed that they had turned that courtyard into like this bizarre market. And Jesus turned over the tables and kicked all these people out of that area. And he said, this is not what this is for. This is a place for, for prayer. So maybe they, maybe they saw Jesus do all of that and, and that caught their attention. Whatever it was, something has caught their attention and they want to meet Jesus. Now Philip apparently wasn't sure what to do. He gets Andrew involved. They take this request. So I just want you to imagine the chain of events. The Gentiles, they're interested to get to know who Jesus is. They ask Philip. Philip asks Andrew. Andrew and Philip go together, talk to Jesus and they bring the request. Hey, these two guys, three guys, whatever it is, they, these guys, they, they want to meet you. They, 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 they want to get to know you. That's the request that they take to Jesus. Look how he responds. Look how Jesus responds. In verse 23, Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man, which is a title for Messiah, to enter into his glory. That's how Jesus responded to this request. Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. And then he launches into this whole thing about his death. In verse 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. It's a curious response, I think, and some of you might be a little confused. Wondering, I, I, I don't understand how that answer matches up with the request that we just heard. And it's okay if that's confusing. When, when Jesus talks about the hour has come or the time has come, what he's talking about is in direct reference it, it, to the Gentiles. It wasn't that he was ignoring the Gentiles. It wasn't that he was not putting priority on them. What he's saying is, okay, now the time has come. Now that the Gentiles, the, the word about Jesus has moved past the Jewish family and into the world of the Gentiles, and now they're interested. Now they're beginning to want to know about Jesus, which is like this trigger point in time. Remember, all the way through that we've been studying uh, through the book of John, we kept hearing this from Jesus. Now is not the time. Now is not the time. We kept hearing that from him. And now, apparently, this, this uh, interest from the Gentiles is a trigger point where Jesus says, okay, it's time. 
It's time for what? Well, the priority is going to shift. Jesus came primarily at first to bring the gospel to the Jewish family. But now, the gospel priority is going to expand beyond just the Jewish nation to the whole world. That's what his glorification is all about. Jesus being glorified means that he's heading back to the Father in heaven. And the way there is through the cross. The way to that glory is through the death, the sacrificial death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead three days later. On the other side of that is glory, the glory of God through the salvation provided by Jesus through his substitute sacrifice on the cross. That's what he's talking about. This mission, this gospel mission and vision is expanding from beyond the Jewish family to this global family of believers that we now call the church. And so the priority for Jesus in this moment, it wasn't that he was ignoring these Gentiles. He's talking about them and he's, and he, and he's saying the gospel, God's glory and the gospel, that's the priority. For Jesus, that's the priority. Keep that in mind as we move on here. Look at verse 25. Now he shifts to this. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Any, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. That first part is kind of curious at first. Jesus is not teaching us to to hate ourselves. He's not, he's not encouraging us to, to have suicidal thoughts. That's not what he's talking about here. Jesus is teaching us about priorities. He's, he's teaching us about choosing the, the right things to be the first things. And in this case, he's, ma- he's saying you gotta make sure that you're putting the, the pennies into the bucket marked follow me, into the bucket marked serve me. That's where your pennies need to be going. First things first. The things that matter to Jesus, those, those first things that matter to him should be the first things that matter to us. Hold on to that thought. We'll come back to that. Verse 27. Now my soul is deeply troubled, Jesus says. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? What's the hour? The cross. Should I pray that, that, uh, that, that I don't have to go and do that? Should I pray that there's some other way? Remember the Garden of Gethsemane prayer? Very similar here. Should, should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But then he says, ah, but that's why I came. That's, that, that's the purpose. That's the mission. That's the whole reason why I came was to die as a sacrificial payment for the sins of the world. Verse 28, Father, here's his conclusion. Bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I've already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. When the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder while others declared an angel had spoken to him. And when Jesus told them the voice was for your benefit, not mine, the time for judging the world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out When I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. Jesus is talking about priorities here. He's he's describing this tension that he was feeling between these competing priorities of what should be first things first, this tension between comfort and his mission of the gospel a tension between God's glory and an easier path, a tension between self-sacrifice and self-centeredness. I'm so thankful, and I know many of you are so thankful that Jesus chose to put the priority on the mission, to put the priority on the purpose of the gospel. We would be in trouble, eternal trouble, if he hadn't. Thankfully, Jesus dropped all of his pennies in that bucket that was marked God's glory, in that bucket that was marked the gospel. Let's finish up the text here, verse 35 and 
We'll start in verse 34. The crowd responds to his, he just talked about his death, right? And they respond, wait a minute, wait a minute, time out. We understood from Scripture that the Messiah would live forever. How can you say that the Son of Man will die? Who, just who is this Son of Man anyway? And they're saying it in such a way like they don't know who he is. They're saying it in such a way like, what kind of Messiah are you? We, we thought that the Messiah was going to come and live forever. And you're talking about dying? Well, it doesn't make sense. That doesn't match up for us. So they have a question. And here's Jesus' response. My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time, and then you will become children of light. And after saying these things, Jesus went away. He was hidden from them. You'll notice that they asked this theological question about future events and eschatology, and, and, and so they're asking a, a deep question, but Jesus doesn't put priority on having this big theological debate in that moment. Instead, he points them back to the gospel into this position of priority, of first things first. And he does that by teaching us this important lesson that we all need to make sure that we understand. He talks about time. He talks about how time is limited. See, when he talks about the gospel and its position of priority and how important it really is, you, you can't remove that importance uh, from, you can't disconnect it from the importance of we only have so much time. One day, we will die. One day, Jesus will return. And, and at that point, it will be too late. Time will have run out. And so whatever it is that we're going to do with the gospel, today is the day. Now is the moment. That's his point. We, we don't have forever to discuss this, to make a decision about who is Jesus. As Jesus talks about how time is limited, that eventually time will run out, he talks about two ways to apply that truth. You know that to be true. You know that in everyday life, you only have so much time in a day. You have so many hours to get things done. We all have the same amount of time. The same thing's true in, in our lifetimes. Our, our, our lives have a limited shelf life and in the context of that reality, Jesus applies it in two ways. One, he says, you need to trust me. Trust in me, Jesus says. Trust in him as the, your forgiver of sin. Trust in him as the, the savior of your soul, the one who can forgive you, the one who can make you right with the Father, give you eternal life. That's the context of the gospel that he's talking about. We've got a limited time, so make sure you don't waste time. Trust in Jesus today. That's the one way he applies it. The second way he applies it, he uses this phrase, son of light. Well, he's the light, son of the light means he's talking about what it looks like to be a disciple, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And he says, we only have so many days on this planet. Time is limited, so don't waste time. Chasing after things don't matter. You have a limited amount of time. Make sure that you're putting priority on following Jesus, on serving Jesus. Jesus. That's the other way that he applies this. Don't waste time with things that don't bring glory to God. Priorities are not about us trying to achieve balance. Priorities are about putting first things first. So how do we do that? How do, how do we figure out where to put our pennies not everything in life is of equal importance. Not everything in life has eternal value. And it's not even that we're trying to figure out which buckets are right or wrong. Obviously, we shouldn't be putting our coins in buckets that are sinful. That should go without saying, if we're a follower of Christ, we shouldn't be trying to put our pennies in buckets that are sinful. So let's just take that off the table. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about things that may or may not, they may not even be wrong, they may not even be bad. They may be fine, morally, ethically, but maybe they're just not as important as other buckets when we have our limited resources that we're talking about. That's what we're trying to figure out. Well, based on what Jesus taught us in this, in this text about priorities and, and his priorities and what he taught us about how to do this, I'm going to see if I can describe it in, in a very practical, simple way. 
When you're, when you're looking at all the buckets in your life, what if, we, what if we asked three simple questions? We have a limited amount of resources, time, energy, money, all of that. We have a limited amount of time, and we're trying to figure out, okay, which, which buckets do we put all of this? What if we asked ourselves of every penny three simple questions? Here's the first one. Could we ask this question? Does this bucket, whatever it is, does this bucket have eternal value? Does this bucket, I'm about to throw this resource, this penny, this coin of my time, my energy, my attention, my heart, does it have eternal value? Verse 25 of chapter 12, when when Jesus says, those who love their life will, uh, in, in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for this life in this world will keep it for eternity. He's talking about eternal value in our priorities He said something very similar, and that might sound a little difficult to understand. So let me take you to Matthew chapter 6. Listen to this. Jesus said it very plainly in Matthew 6, 19. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them, where rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven. Well, how do we do that? That has to be something eternal. We're not taking physical coins with us to heaven. So this has to be something that has eternal value to it, that that's where our focus of priority should be. Treasure in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And then later in that chapter, he says, so don't worry. Don't be consumed with worry about things like, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? He says, These are the kind of things that dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. So, in response to that understanding of who God is and his love for you, he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. In first position priority, first things first priority, is the kingdom of God, the things that matter to God. And live righteously. If we do that, we just put God first, the things that matter to God, we'll put that first in priority. All these other things, all these other buckets, God will take care of. We don't need to worry about it. Things of eternal value. Now, they can apply that in lots of different ways. Here's here's one way. I'm thinking about our, our parent commitment coming up here at the end of the month and preparing for that, praying about what I want to say to our parents. And as I've been praying through that, This is one of the ways that we can apply this first things first principle when it comes to parenting. Because there are so many, there are so many options, so many choices, so many opportunities for kids. Maybe it was like that a long time ago. I don't know. I just know uh, as as our kids were being raised and and, uh, even today, it's there's just so many things, so many, so many opportunities for our kids. And sometimes it, it, it feels like as parents, you know, we've got like a dump truck load of coins and we're just dumping them in every bucket we can find. We don't want our kids to miss out on anything. So they're going to be involved in this and this and this. And their schedules are from morning up, you know, to sunset at night. And we're just going to go, 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 go. And just coin, into this bucket, into this bucket. And it's not even that these things are bad or wrong. But for some kids, for some kids, it's too much. For some kids, it is just, it is too much. And they are on a pathway to burnout. Not every child is like that. There are some children, they've, they've got lots of interests and skill sets and, and uh, they have a, a, a tolerance, a high tolerance for a busy schedule, right? That, that certainly can be true. And as parents, we have to figure that out. We have to figure out, okay, where are we going to put the pennies? There's 100 buckets here. Are we going to try and fill them all? Well, as you try to figure all that out, can I just offer this caution to you as a parent? As you're trying to figure out all the buckets to put your coins into, let's imagine that there's one of those buckets that's marked fall in love with Jesus. Let's imagine there's a bucket that is marked learn how to follow Jesus and live a Jesus-centered life. Let's imagine there's a bucket that's called that. 
And as you're trying to figure out where we put all the coins, could I just encourage you, caution you, let's make sure, let's make sure we're filling that one up. Let's make sure the one that says, I want my children to fall in love with Jesus and follow him and make him first in their lives. Can we just make sure that that one is getting enough pennies? I think about where we're at, where Angie and I are at now as parents. We're at the other end of that. And so we've got uh, a daughter that's graduated from college now and, and trying to figure that out what's next and one that's halfway through college and kind of know where, where he's headed in a career path. We have a daughter who's a senior in high school and only God knows where she's going to land. We're like, I got this, this front row seat. We don't know either. We're like, I don't know, Lord. We don't, we don't know what uh, you're going to do in her life. We know it's going to be great. We're excited about it, but we'll have to let God sort all that out. So it, it, that's kind of the stage. And, and as I just think about you know, where our kids are and what's next in their lives, you know, they have goals, they have aspirations. And if you know my family well enough, you probably know what some of those things are. And as I think about that, as I reflect on that, here's what I would say when it comes to priorities. Let's imagine that my kids achieve those goals that they're chasing after. Well, we all hope that for our kids, right? We all hope that our, our children grow up, chase after some goals, and have success. We all want that. Certainly requires some pennies to get them there. But let's imagine, I'll just take my son for example. Let's imagine my son, he graduates from college, gets a great job, makes a decent living, drives a nice car, lives in a nice house. Let's say he gets all that. But if he's a terrible husband, if he is an absent father, if he has no interest whatsoever in following Jesus, I don't care how much money he makes. My heart will break. I'm not saying anything he doesn't know. He's sitting in the room. He knows my heart because we've had this conversation since he was small. My point is, those things matter, right? Those, those things require coins, effort, time, money, all that. It's not that those, things, those other buckets don't matter, but there's just some buckets that matter more. And so as we're trying to sort all of those things out, it's not that we're trying to find equal balance. No, when it comes to, I wanna make sure that my children fall in love with Jesus, I've gotta make sure I'm putting coins in that bucket. How do I do that? Well, we'll talk about that on the 25th, about some of the practical ways I think we can do that. That's eternal value. How much money I make in a lifetime, what kind of job we have, what kind of career, all these things, it's not they don't matter. But they're not gonna matter as much as what kind of husband, what kind of wife, what kind of parent, what kind of follower of Jesus. Those things just matter more. Does the bucket have eternal value? If it does, well, then it's, it's worth it's worth throwing pennies in. Here's, here's, a second, here's a second question. As we're thinking about, okay, where do we put all of our pennies? Where do we put all of our buckets or coins? Does the bucket have eternal value? Does the bucket advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus admitted he was experiencing this inner tension about, you know, he got the gospel mission, which is why he came. But that gospel mission required him to go to the cross and endure physical torture. Not only that, but it required him to endure the spiritual torture of every sin from all time being placed on him. That's the substitutionary sacrifice part. That's unimaginable, even beyond the physical part. But that's the mission. That's the gospel purpose. And thankfully, Jesus was committed to this mission of grace and forgiveness of sin, not just to the Jewish family, but to the whole world. Thankfully, Jesus was willing to put all his pennies in the bucket that was marked transformation of souls, and not the bucket marked personal comfort. 
You know, there's a, a tension, I think, that's been brewing in our country. I don't know when it started. Maybe it's been around a while, but I know it's surfaced more recently in more recent years, this tension uh, that exists about priorities of resources. Where, where should the priority of our resources be as in, in, in America? And one of the, the phrases that has kind of risen to the, the surface over the last several years is America first, right? The, the priority of our resources needs to be America first. And then you have other people say, no, it shouldn't be that. It should be this. And so there's this debate that goes, and I'm not trying to sort all of that out with you. Here's what I, the reason I bring it up is because that, that idea cannot be how we see the gospel. The idea of America first or our nation first cannot, it's, it's, it does not match up with the Great Commission. When it comes to the gospel, yes, uh, our priority starts at, at home uh, with our families and then our friends, our communities. Certainly our nation needs help. And it, it's not that, yes, there are good ideas there are good policies and there are bad ideas and po- uh, bad policies. Yes, that is true. But what's really going to make a dramatic difference in our country is the heart. People need Jesus. That's the long and the short of it. People need to be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that has to be our priority when it comes to these conversations, when it comes to our priorities uh, in, in how we spend our money and how we spend our time. How do we advance the gospel? When it comes to things like globally, it, it doesn't matter what color a person's skin is. It doesn't matter what country they're from. People all over this globe need to hear about Jesus. Well, how, how, do we, how do we make that a priority? There's lots of ways to apply that, advancing the gospel. One, one simple way is there's lots of good places to, to give your, your time, lots of good places to give your money, lots of, uh, lo- lots of charities that have tremendous value, right? Lots of them, lots of choices, but you only have so many pennies. You only have so many pennies you can put in those, in those buckets. And so when I, when I think about advancing the gospel, when I think about the limited amount of coins that we have, it's not that uh, giving to this bucket over here, that's a, a charity that has nothing to do with, with the church or the gospel has, has no value. That's, that's not true. It does have value, uh, but when it comes to where do I've only got one penny and I got a choice between two buckets, well, which one of those, if I've only got one penny and two buckets, which one of those is going to advance the gospel? That should take the priority over other buckets if we, if we only have so many pennies to work with. If you've got enough pennies to give to everything, that's amazing. That's, that's wonderful. We have limited resources, and so we have to figure, okay, how do I give to God first? How do I give to missions first? How do I, you know, when when we talk about the local church, and we've got a kids' ministry going on on the other side of this wall, and they're learning who Jesus is. They're learning how to follow Jesus and fall in love with him, and that matters. And that's part of where our weekly tithes and offerings go to make sure that those things are happening at a high level. These things matter. So that's just one way that we could apply when we're thinking about our, our resources of our time. You know, you give, you give of yourself, you give of your time to different things, maybe in the community, and that's awesome. But are you giving of yourself, of your time, when it comes to the gospel and, and helping out in our kids' ministry or in our host ministry, all these different places? These things matter. If the bucket advances the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's definitely worthy of first things first priority. So we've got the gospel, eternal value. Here's the third one, last one. Does this bucket, as I'm trying to decide where I put my coins, does this bucket draw me into a closer relationship with Jesus? Verse 26 of chapter 12, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Meeting Jesus, trusting him as our savior from sin is the first part of the gospel that has the most eternal value. Yes, but it's not the full measure of the gospel because Jesus is not an insurance agent that is trying to sell us fires of hell insurance. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus is calling us into this authentic relationship with him. He wants us to follow him, obey him, serve him. He wants us to have a relationship. It's not about us checking off boxes. Sometimes I think that Christians have this transactional relationship 
concept of who God is. Okay, God, I, I showed up to church. I put some coins in the, in the, in the box back there. I sang some songs. I, I smiled at like three people. And uh, so I did all these good things. Check, 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 check. And now here's what I expect you to do for me. Bang, bang. I want you to do this, this. It's like a transactional relationship with God. And that's not what he's interested in. He wants your heart. He wants you and I to surrender our hearts to him. So when we're talking about these coins, it's not, it's not a sense of duty where we, oh, I have to put the coins in this bucket or God will be mad at me. That's, that's not the heart attitude of what we're talking about. It's an issue of love. It's an issue of authentic relationship. And so when it comes time to how do we do that, how do we develop that relationship, that authentic love relationship with Jesus, first thing, first thing, a first priority is spending time with Jesus every day in private worship. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to be in the morning, but sometime during the day, and for most of us, that's probably the best time before we get our day started, but if it doesn't work that way and it's uh, over your lunch break, if it's, if, uh, if it's later in the evening, we just, you have to figure that out in your schedule, but there has to be time during the day that you're spending with Jesus. There has to be a first things first priority. It's not, it's not about, uh, yeah, okay, but, but I'm really well-behaved, and I'm a really good citizen. Okay, that's, that's great. I know some really well-behaved people that are far from God. They're well-behaved. They don't break the rules. They don't break the law. They're actually uh, pretty helpful. They give you the shirt off their back kind of people. I, I know people like that, but they, they have no relationship with Jesus. And so what we're talking about is, is something beyond, well, I just, I want to I wanna be a well-behaved person and a really good citizen. Okay, fine. Jesus wants your heart. He wants you to surrender your life. He wants a relationship with you. So whatever I can do to, to draw my heart into that deeper, intimate relationship, well, then that's worth, that's worth putting coins into that. Same thing with Corporate worship, what we're doing this morning, Hebrews 13, 25 says that this matters. What you and I are doing together this morning matters. Don't forsake the gathering, the assembly of yourselves together as some get in the habit of doing. Instead, make this a priority. And then it goes on to say, because the days are getting worse. The, 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 the more upside down the world gets, the more we need this. The more we need each other. The more we need corporate worship in our lives, not less. Giving God your best by offering your time, your talents, your resources. It's not just about checking boxes. It's about a relationship. So anything that we can do, any, any coins we can throw in buckets that is going to draw our hearts into a deeper relationship with him, absolutely worth every penny of our time, of our effort, of our self-sacrifice, whatever it is. Priorities are not about trying to achieve balance Priorities are trying to figure out first things first. Every day we get to choose to give greater weight to the things that we believe are more important, things that we believe are of greater significance than all the other buckets that we could throw our pennies into. And so we have to ask ourselves the question from time to time, am I throwing my pennies in the right bucket? Am I giving weight to the right priorities? There's a song, I'm going to close with this idea, okay? A way to take this with us. There's a song on the radio called First Things First. You heard the song? Most of us have probably heard that song. I'm not going to read it to you. If you haven't heard it, it's easy to remember First Things First. Look it up. Listen to it on the way home today. The reason I bring it up is because the guys who wrote that song... Uh, the reason they wrote it, uh, the band's been doing really well. They're seeing a lot of success. Things are going great. And then their dad had a stroke and died. And they were devastated. As you can imagine, if you've been through an experience like that, you've lost someone, it's, it's, it's terrible. It, it, it's, it's heart-wrenching and it's, it's soul-rattling. And that's where they were at. And what they said is when they went through that, they weren't sure if they even wanted to continue their music career. They weren't sure what to do. They were just rattled. And as they prayed through that season of sorrow and pain in their lives, what came out of it was this song called First Things First. As they, 
as they began to look at their priorities, as they began to think about what really matters in life. And it totally resonates with me. I totally get that. Because the different seasons of life that I've been through that have been the most painful typically are the seasons of life where I start thinking those kinds of questions. What really matters in life? This thing that I've been so worried about, this thing that I've been putting my attention on so much, doesn't matter as much as this person that I love that I just lost. And the people around me that I love and, 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 and I want to have a deeper relationship with and I don't want to waste time doing things that don't matter, right? Those are the seasons of life that rattle us and we start to think of those kinds of questions. My encouragement to all of us is let's not wait for those seasons of life to come along. They will. They will happen to all of us. And you'll ask the questions. What matters? Where are my priorities? Am I putting stuff in the right buckets? You'll have those inner conversations. But why wait? Why wait for those difficult days to ask those questions, to think about where you are putting your time, your energy, your resources, your heart? I would encourage you this week to just take a little bit of time today, this week, and begin practicing thinking about from time to time. Maybe you don't have uh, the ability to do this every day, but from time to time, just think about where am I putting my priorities? Are they really on the things that matter? You only have so much time. You only have so much energy, physical, emotional, all of that. Are you putting your pennies in the places that truly matter? And it's not that you have to eliminate all the buckets. Just make sure the buckets that matter are getting the proper amount of coins that are getting the, the coins that they really need and deserve. Lord, thanks so much for the opportunity to be together. And as I think about things in life that have eternal value, things in life that advance the gospel, things in life that are going to draw my heart close to you, I pray that you would help me to sort that out daily And I pray the same for those who are gathered here. Lord, you mentioned in in the text this morning that time is limited, that we only have so much time. And so I pray for those maybe who might be sitting here today that don't have a relationship with you at all yet. I pray that this morning you would soften their hearts, you would humble their heart to the point where they would realize the reality of that, that eventually time will run out. And then what's on the other side of this? Life. And I pray that they will, that they will make a, a, a decision, a faith-based decision to trust you as their forgiver of sin, Savior from hell, the Lord of their life, the only one who can truly transform them and give them eternal life. Lord, I pray for those of us who have made that decision maybe many years ago, and Lord, there's still days when all these years later we're, we're putting pennies and buckets that don't matter. And sometimes that's okay. But sometimes we're doing that and ignoring buckets that do. Help us figure that out, Lord. Help us to be honest with you about those things. And and if there's priority changes that you want to make in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, then I ask that you, through your Holy Spirit, would challenge us. And we'll thank you for that too. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand and we'll sing this song.